Greetings to all of my psych cognitive psychology students. In this video, I am going to introduce you to the concept of inductive learning. And I'm also going to talk about uh, the article that you, that you read for this week's um, extension activity, which is Cornell and Bjork 2008. So in most cases, right, when we think about uh, learning or what we want to teach someone, right? So let's suppose that you are uh, an elementary school math teacher, okay? So you're accustomed to maybe teaching eight-year-olds how to um, uh, how to do multiplication tables or maybe how to do how to solve word problems or something like that. Um, so typically what you would do is you would uh, show your students several or go through several examples of how to solve a word problem, right? And then you would give them a new problem to solve. And similarly, if you are a doctor, right, and your uh, professors at your medical school want to teach you how to identify um, something on an x-ray, right? So let's suppose they were interested in teaching you uh, how to identify um, nodules on an x-ray of a lung right? Or maybe some kind of infiltrates or some kind of lung cancer. So they want to show you, here's what an x-ray looks like in a patient with small cell lung cancer, right? So what they would do is they would show you several x-rays um, that are of patients with lung cancer, and then maybe they would um, introduce you to a new patient, maybe live and in person, and show you the x-rays of this new patient and ask you whether or not they have signs of lung cancer, right? So that's essentially what inductive learning is. Is uh, Last week, we talked about optimizing memory, right? And the particular type of learning we were talking about in those cases was often just recall, right? So I give students a list of words or maybe a chapter in a textbook, and then I test them on the same exact information, right? So I see how many words can they recall out of 30 from the list of 30 that I gave them, or how many ideas uh, from the textbook chapter that they just read, can they actually remember, right? So it's basically verbatim recall that we talked about last week. In contrast, inductive learning is when you show people a bunch of examples or a bunch of instances of a particular concept or category, and then you, the, the test, is whether or not they can categorize new information. Okay, so again, another way to say that is inductive learning refers to the ability to generalize concepts and categories from exposure to multiple exemplars and apply to new exemplars. So that's just a very complicated way of, sh of saying, I show you a bunch of something, and then you have to decide later on whether a new um, example is an example of that category or not. Okay, and a lot of times in teaching, what we decide to do is teach one concept at a time, right? So if you're a geometry teacher um, and you want to introduce students to the concept of uh, how to find the radius or how to find the area of a triangle, right? You would give them a bunch of different examples of math problems um, related to this concept, 
and then you would give them a new problem where they have to do the exact same thing, just with different numbers, right? So find the radius of this circle, find the area of this triangle, right? So that's what we're accustomed to, is whenever we're trying to learn a new concept, um, just seeing a bunch of different examples and then generalizing that learning to a new example of that category. Right, and like I said, a, a very natural sort of real world example of inductive learning would be if you're a medical student um, and you are given a bunch of different x-rays of different patients with various lung problems, right? So you would see a bunch of x-rays um, with a person who has pneumonia, and then you would look at those um, examples of pneumonia and be able to tell on a new x-ray that the person has pneumonia, right? Or lung cancer or something else. So you're learning to decipher a particular pattern of visual features there. Right? Just like with the math problem, you're learning to decipher um, the particular steps that you have to go through to solve the problem. So let's suppose that I want to take a bunch of Mercer students to serve in a Mercer on mission. And this particular Mercer on mission is going to be a rescue trip looking for Jintu penguins, okay? Um, and just for the record, Jintu penguins is a fictional breed of penguin, right? But let's suppose I wanted a bunch of students to maybe find the Jintus and, you know, collect a bunch of evidence and maybe put trackers on them, right? So if that was my plan, um, then one of the skills I would need to teach my future MOM students is I would need to teach them how to recognize what a Gen 2 penguin looks like, right? So one possibility is I could just show them a bunch of pictures of Gen 2 penguins. Right? So if, if we were to look at a bunch of pictures right, we might start to realize maybe some of the distinguishing features of a Gentoo penguin. So all of these penguins seem to have, for example, a bright orange beak, and they tend to have little uh, kind of, uh, it's, a, it's almost like their uh, beaks are painted with a little bit of black, right? And they also seem to have a, a little bit of white on their face as well, and particularly around the eyes, right? So you might, uh, if, you were, uh, if you were a student kind of training to recognize a, a Gentoo penguin, you might identify those features as being central to the category of Gentoo penguin. Okay. Again, I'm showing you all the pictures of Gentoos. And then your final test, right, would be I would give you a bunch of pictures of different types of penguins, one of which is the Gentoo, and you would have to identify it, right? So the Gentoo penguin, as it turns out, is the guy right here in the top uh, left, um, corner there, so that's our Gen 2 penguin, right? So when I show people, when I show my students all of the pictures of Gen 2 penguins, that is referred to as blocking or massing, okay? So when you see a bunch of different examples of the same thing, that's blocking and massing. Right? And like we just said, presumably, seeing a bunch of different examples of the same category is going to allow the learner to notice the characteristics that all of the examples have in common. Right? So all Gentoo penguins have those bright orange beaks 
and the little uh, arch of white around their eyes. Um, and maybe they all have uh, white stomachs as well. Um, whereas if we were to interleave the picture, so interleaving our spacing just means to uh, take a bunch of different species of penguins, right? So we have the Reinhardt and the Gentoo um, and a bunch of other species all mixed up, okay? In the learning phase, um, it's going to be much harder for you to notice um, which uh, which penguin is the Gentoo, right? So one possibility again is to show the learner a bunch of different examples from the same category, and that's called blocking or massing. Or we could interleave or space the exemplars. So that a bunch of different categories are kind of mixed together, right? And the uh, sort of initial hypothesis of uh, cognitive psychologists is that in this case, massing is better because it allows the learner to notice what all of the Gentoos have in common or what core features make a penguin a Gentoo. Okay, but if you remember from last week, a lot of evidence has shown that spacing can actually improve recall, right? So spacing, um, as we talked about it last week, um, is also something called distributed practice, right? So instead of cramming or massing when you're studying for an exam and studying for eight hours straight with spacing, you would literally space out your study sessions in time, right? So that's called distributed practice or distributed learning, where instead of studying for eight hours the night before your exam, you study for two hours each night, the four days prior to your exam, right? And we've shown that to be very helpful. Um, so a very famous cognitive psychologist, Ernst Rothkopf, was quoted as saying, spacing is the friend of recall, but the enemy of induction, right? So another way of thinking about that is spacing is good if you're going to be tested on the exact same information, right? So if you're in a class, right, where you're being tested on all of the information from uh, lectures and the textbook, okay, which most college students are, then it probably makes sense for you to adopt a spacing strategy, right? And it's really kind of the same thing because time elapses between your first presentation of a Gentoo penguin and your next one because they're separated in time by a bunch of other different penguins, right? So really it's the same, it's the same process, right? So spacing apart uh, your learning episodes is good when you're going to be tested on the exact same information, but if you have to, um, if you are given new examples of something, then maybe spacing isn't a good strategy, right? So for example, if you have to um, identify uh, a species of penguin, or if you have to identify whether a particular statistics problem is going to require um, a t-test or uh, a chi-squared test, or um, I realize a lot of you maybe haven't taken statistics, but those are all different types of um, operations that we use, right? So, so again, if you have to identify when to use a particular formula, right, then maybe spacing isn't a good option because you're gonna you're going to have to identify new examples of something and decide whether they fit in the category, right? So again, in essence, um, Rothkopf's 
hypothesis um, was that because spacing examples out in time makes it more difficult to identify the distinguishing features, okay, then massing or cramming where you see a bunch of different examples of the same thing might actually be a better strategy. Okay, so this is where the experiment comes in. Okay, so Cornell and Bjork decided to test this hypothesis, right? So they, so they created an induction task, and what they were testing specifically was whether massing or, um, or blocking would be a better strategy than, um, than spacing or massing, where you see all of the same pictures. And honestly, what Cornell and Bjork expected, the researchers expected, is that they would confirm Rothkopf's hypothesis. So they expected that uh, showing participants a bunch of the same examples together would be better than interleaving them with other categories, right? But first, let's talk about how they did this, okay? So if you were a, uh, if you were a participant in this experiment, uh, you would be shown 72 paintings for three seconds each, okay? And of those 72 paintings, what they consisted of was 12 different artists, okay? So there are 12 different categories, and there are six pictures per artist, right? So 12 different categories and six different exemplars or examples, right? And their goal was to learn to recognize which artist painted a new picture based on their style, right? So again, they, they see 72 pictures for three seconds each, and those 72 pictures consist of 12 different artists, and they have six examples of pictures painted by that artist, okay? And their task, what they do after seeing all those 72 paintings, is that they were shown 40, 48 new paintings they have never seen before, and they have to identify who painted each one, right? So this is inductive learning because instead of writing down or drawing all of the, all of the 72 paintings they just saw, which would be a recall task, Right? Instead, they're looking at brand new paintings and trying to decide which of those 12 artists painted it. Okay? And they had a blocked or masked condition. Right, so in the blocked or masked condition, you would see six paintings back to back painted by the same artist, right? So these pictures were painted by Lewis, right? And just looking at all those pictures, right, um, you might start to recognize that Lewis usually painted landscapes right? Um, and a lot of them maybe were winter scenes, and he used very thick um, brush strokes as opposed to thinner brush strokes. Um, and he has this kind of, again, I'm not really an artist, so I can't give you the, the terminology, but um, it's kind of smudgy, right? It almost looks like maybe uh, he used a sponge at some point to create those, to create those pictures. Right? So having seen all of those Lewis paintings, maybe I can generalize what features all of the Lewis paintings have in common. Right? Now this was the interleaved or spaced condition. 
okay? And in this condition, you saw the 72 paintings, but instead of seeing uh, six paintings of the same artist back to back, you now saw um, the 72 paintings by the 12 artists, um, but they were all mixed up, okay? So here's what it looked like. Okay, so in that case, you have all different paintings. So maybe it's harder to generalize the unifying features of that, of each of the artist's category, right? And so this was the final test that participants have to do. This is a, had to do. This is a brand new painting, right? And they had to decide uh, whether it was a um, which of the artists um, painted that painting um, and they were also given feedback as to whether it was correct or not okay so if we look at the results right we find that there is a clear benefit of spacing or interleaving right so participants in the uh, interleaved condition had about a 60% accuracy rate, or 60% of the time they were correct when uh, they identified which painter had painted the new paintings that they saw, as opposed to the, the blocked condition where they saw all of the Lewis paintings back to back to back, and all of the Pisani paintings back to back to back. Um, they were at about 30%, right? So the accuracy rate was almost double um, uh, in the interleaved condition was almost double that of the math condition, okay? So that very strongly goes against the um, Earth, Ernest Rothkopf's hypothesis that uh, uh, spacing is the enemy of induction. Another interesting uh, thing that Cornell and Bjork um, uh, determined was they actually asked participants, which do you think helped you learn the artists better? The blocked condition where you saw all of the artists' paintings together, uh, the interleaved condition where all of the artists were mixed up, or do you think you did about the same in the blocked and interleaved, um, for the blocked and interleaved categories? Okay, so this is the actual result. Um, so this is the uh, percentage of participants who did better in the blocked case um, or the interleaved case, or they, their performance was the same in both the blocked and interleaved uh, cases. Um, and again, what they found is a clear, clear benefit um, for interleaving or mixing all of the artists up. But their predictions were exactly the opposite. So they thought, as they were viewing the paintings, that they were getting a better sense of the categories or the artists by seeing all of their paintings at the same time, when in actuality, the interleaved or spaced condition where they saw um, all of the artists um, mixed up was much, much better for their recall. So uh, because of this, Cornell and Bjork had to modify their hypothesis, right? So um, the, the original hypothesis they had um, was that blocking or massing the paintings together allowed the learner to identify what all of the paintings had in common or how all of the paintings were similar to each other. And now they modified it to interleaving or spacing is better because it highlights 
the differences, okay? So when you interleave or space out the paintings, okay, what happens is a natural comparison process where you might ask yourself, okay, um, Lewis used very broad uh, brush strokes um, whereas, uh, whereas, you know, this Schlorf painting, um, was much more softer in appearance and maybe used thinner brush strokes and maybe, um, looked much more realistic than, um, than what Lou was painting, right? And the Hawkins lacked the same sort of shape or precision as either the Lewis or the Schlorf painting, right? So this might be something that um, participants naturally do as they're going through the task, um, looking for, um, again, uh, what separates or distinguishes a Lewis from a Hawkins, for example. So we see that the interleaving benefit um, is very robust in that it's um, been replicated using a lot of different experiments, right? So for example, if you want to teach children um, a new category of shape, right? So you might show children a bunch of different objects and say that this particular object is a wug, for example, right? And you want the children to learn how to identify a wug from a bunch of different objects. Um, it turns out that children are better at distinguishing a wug from, an, from uh, some other uh, imaginary shape um, when they're shown all of the shapes mixed together than if they were shown all of the wugs kind of at the same time in succession. We also see similar benefits for interleaving uh, in both uh, college students and older adults. Um, uh, this was a really interesting experiment where they showed instead of artists, they showed people different bird families or bird species um, and showed them pictures that were either masked or interleaved. And the interleaving case uh, resulted in much better in inductive learning or identification of the birds. Um, and the same is true of human voices. So people can learn to distinguish between um, human voices uh, accurately, provided they are given an interleaved or spaced presentation where all of the voices are kind of, uh, the different people are mixed up. And again, mathematics concepts. So a lot of different studies have shown that kids will learn uh, for example, geometry much better if instead of showing that having them do a bunch of circumference problems over and over and over again, right? Um, if you show them many different concepts, so if you show them, here's how you find the area of a circle, here's how you find the area of a triangle, here's how you find the area of a square, etc. Um, kids end up doing much better on new problems of those particular types um, than they would if they just did a bunch of uh, circumference problems and then a bunch of uh, triangle problems, etc. Okay, so here is a summary for you. Okay, uh, spacing and interleaving is beneficial for learning. Spacing benefits recall of the same information by promoting retrieval, variability, and also sustaining attention, right? So this is exactly what we learned last week um, when I was talking about why spacing or distributed practice is better. So spacing, for example, your study sessions out over several days 
is better because naturally some forgetting occurs between those study sessions, right? And that forces you to actively retrieve the information from your memory, right? Because it's not in your short-term memory anymore. So you have to actually uh, take the step to recall it from your long-term memory which is considered uh, active retrieval, which is very, very good for future recall. Similarly, uh, spacing is good for recall of previously learned information um, because if you space your study sessions out in time, um, you're probably going to be in a different location or a different frame of mind, for example. Um, and all of the external and internal cues that go along with those environment or internal changes are going to become associated with that new information, right? And similarly, spacing is better than massing for recall of information. Um, because if you study for eight hours straight, right, it's going to be, <coughs> excuse me, it's going to be very difficult for you to pay attention uh, for those long intervals, um, and it would be much easier for you to remain focused for an hour or two hours than it would be for eight hours, for example. Right. So that's why spacing benefits uh, learning when we're trying to recall the exact information that we learned. Interleaving or uh, um, mixing up a bunch of examples of different categories is beneficial for inductive learning. Um, because it allows you to highlight the differences between categories, uh, allowing you to discriminate between those categories, right? Um, and we see this again with inductive learning, where you have to identify new members of that category, right? Okay, so uh, this video is already a little bit longer than some of my previous videos. So I'm going to go ahead and stop here. Um, as you, If you have any questions about the article or the questions for um, this assignment, your extension assignment, please let me know. And I look forward to seeing you in my next video.